to Soho Trent and the world. This is Six Towns Radio. The Jason Dale Radio Show. The way you like it. That was the Beatles with my Bonnie, live on Six Towns Radio and live in the studio right now, um, direct from the Casbah in Liverpool, we have none other than original Beatles drummer, Pete Best. Are you there, Pete? I'm here, Jason. Can you hear me? Very good. Loud and clear. Coming directly from the Casbah. Are you at the Casbah now, Pete? Yeah, I'm uh, just running the offices. Fantastic. What's it like down there these days? I mean, you've been there a long time, haven't you? Yeah, I mean, it's great. The, you know, we've got a physical recognition with uh, Heyman Screen and the Casbah as a World Heritage Site. Um, and the, you know, the tourist side of it, you know, the people coming into the Casbah on a daily basis is growing day by day, so it's wonderful. Absolutely fantastic. So on a daily basis, I mean, what's the atmosphere like down there? I mean, what kind of people, from, is it from all over the world? You get Japanese, Australians? What? Oh, yeah, I mean, if we use an example, you know, every year we do a show called Best Fest. Yeah. We've got another one coming up this year in That's August, um, which I'm certain we'll talk about later. Yeah. But the cross-section of people coming in on a daily basis, apart from those shows, is absolutely fantastic. It's global, um, you know, from Japan to India, from Australia to New Zealand, from New Zealand to Sweden, you could go on and on and on. Fantastic. And it's absolutely fantastic, and they all say the same thing. The atmosphere and the story behind it is absolutely incredible. Oh, and it is, yeah. Now, I was watching something uh, only a couple of days ago regarding uh, when you, when the Best family moved into uh, Heyman's Green. Is it number eight, Heyman's Green, yeah? It is, yeah, number yeah. eight, yeah. And uh, the history is quite amazing. It's a, it's a 15-room mansion, isn't it? It is, yeah. <laughs> I mean, a lot of people think, you know, the Heyman's Green, it, it, you know, because it's in a, a suburb of Liverpool, you know, and it, yeah. what used to be a quiet village. And they expect it to be like, you know, a little cottage somewhere, you know, tucked <laughs> away in the backwaters. And of course, when they come here, it's a 16-bedroom mansion, you know, a 16-room mansion. Amazing, yeah. Standing in its own ground, it's absolutely incredible in its own right. I've tried to picture, Pete, what it was like when uh, your mum, it was Mona, wasn't it? Who dis- yeah, decided yeah, Mona, to, yeah. to open the Casbah. I've tried to picture what it's like, because I used to, uh, you know, I've been in music and we've played rock and roll in garages and in rehearsed at home and that. What was it like to have a club with people coming and, you know, drinking Coca-Cola? And I've seen the Coca-Cola signs Well, outside. it was, you know, when we when she first told us about the idea, yeah. I mean, there was a look of amazement within the family, but, you know, we believed in her and we believed what she wanted to do. Yeah. And, of course, we decorated it as a family concern, but the opening night was something incredible. I can imagine. I mean, you know, prior to it, the word was out on the street, Jason, and before we had, you know, the opening night came, which was the 25th of August, I think, in 1959, yeah. round right about there. Yeah. Um, we had 200 members, you know, people had 200. knocked up the door, kids yeah. around the village yeah. from astray, you know, had yeah. knocked up the door and turned around and said, we believe you're opening a club. Didn't know what it was about, didn't <laughs> know what was going to I'm just knew it was going to play music, yeah. and they wanted to be members. And of course, on that opening night, you know, the the band which opened it, the Corey Men, which yeah. later went on to become the Beatles, as everyone knows now. Yeah, of course. The place was jam packed. We would, we were having tea at four o'clock in the afternoon. The club yeah. opened at half past seven. Right. And at four o'clock in the afternoon, we looked down. There were queues down the garden, amazing, down the path, all the way onto Heyman's Green. And instead of you know sort of opening the doors at seven o'clock, we had to open the doors and start taking membership. Yeah. At five o'clock. And tell the kids to stand in line to get into uh, get into the Casbah when the doors actually opened. Fantastic. What uh, what did the neighbours make of it, Pete? What what, so, what was that again, Jason? What did the neighbours make of all the crowds and the, you know the queues and whatnot? <laughs> well, we had, there was a mixed reception actually. You know, there was uh, because of what was going on, and it was like nothing else like this was really going on in Liverpool. Yeah. You know, um, course, especially yeah. in the basements. Yeah. Uh, well, this particular area, of Liverpool. Anyway, yeah. there was a mixed reception, but Mona was quite. You know, diplomatic, she turned around and said, well, you know, those that don't like it and may have raised some concern, yeah. she invited them in. Oh. You know, come in and see Brilliant. the Casbah, yeah. see what it's all about. <laughs> it was wonderful, <laughs> because those people that would complain and became members, oh, that's you fantastic. know, and they became part of the Casbah household, so... Yeah. All of the all of the houses in the streets in Heyman Green yeah. were members of the Casbah. It was absolutely wonderful. It's absolutely fantastic to hear this side of it because we there's many things on YouTube. I was uh, I saw a, a, a small interview with Paul McCartney and he was he said the Casbah is as important for British rock music as the Cavern. 
And, uh, it must probably be more important, to be quite honest. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, that sounds a little bit uh, biased coming from, you know, the best family or a member of it. Right. Simply because we own it. But I suppose in priority, we were the first rock seller. Yeah. You know, before the cabin. The cabin was still a jazz seller. Yeah. And the bands, you know, we were the, you know, we were the nemesis. You know, we were the... Uh, you know, the the basis from what the, the Mersey Beach scene in Liverpool took off from, because nearly every band in Liverpool, you know, from audition bands to top-ranking bands like Jerry and the Pacemakers, yeah. the Big D, yeah. I could go on and on. Mm -hmm. They played here, and they all said the same thing. Yeah. It was a great venue to play. Really, and a great atmosphere. But fair play to your well, to your mum, Mona, Pete, to having, for having the foresight yeah. and, uh, you know, somewhere for the youth to go, a good, safe place to hear this new sound of rock and roll or skiffle. And I know my grandparents would have been, oh, I don't know, the four, 30, 40 years of age in the 50s. And I know mm -hmm. they were into swing and Sinatra and stuff. And the new rock and roll sound sounded very, very brash and raucous to them. So Mona had this foresight and belief in the music, didn't she? Oh, she did. She was very young at her. But she was yeah. a young person anyway. Yeah, I suppose so. You yeah. know, the, when you think about it, in 1959, she yeah. was still, you know, in her late, late 20s, early 30s. But apart from that, um, she... She realised that music was important for kids. Yeah. And, you know, this new wave of music that was coming in, you know, the advent of Skiffle, and then it was turning into Skiffle Blues, and then rock, and it would progress like that. Yeah. And, you know, well, we had all the English and American artists coming out. She realised, you know, there were bands in Liverpool. Let's bring these bands to the kids of Liverpool. And that's exactly what she did. Fantastic. And that's why it became such an important, you know, uh, yeah. piece of musical history in Liverpool, I suppose. And the first to do it. In Liverpool. And the first to do it, yes. Because uh, the know. Cavern was a very jazz-orientated venue, wasn't it, with the likes of George Malley and uh, Akabilk and that kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, the Cavern was, was a great jazz seller. I mean, you know, the, you know, before it became, you know, rock and roll. But I think the advent of the Cavern and the importance of the Cavern, once the Casbah closed, you know, because of domestic and social reasons in 62, yeah. um, my mother made that decision, then, you know, the competition has been taken away. Then, the ca you know, the Cavern gradually turned to rock and roll it started to mix rock bands in with you know jazz bands yeah and then as we know now it became totally a rock and roll seller fantastic the music that was played down there pete the music that mm -hmm. influenced the beatles and yourself obviously uh, i mean what yeah. was this what do you remember as being the big thing which changed your your perception of music you know uh, what was the sound going on were you a teddy boy I suppose you could turn around and say, you know, there were different degrees of Teddy Boy, but uh, <laughs> I think if you had a Tony Curtis or an Elvis Presley hairstyle, yeah. regardless of what clothes you wore, whether it be, you know, Beetle Boppers or, you know, Brothel Creepers, whatever we used to call them, the Crape Shoes, yeah. um, you were still identified as a Teddy Boy, you know, but there were so many different attires for it. But I suppose the music which kicked it all off, as far as we were concerned, um, you know, apart from the skiffle, for myself, you know, it was when I heard Elvis Presley yeah. singing Hound Dog, and that just basically, I suppose you could turn around, the hairs on the back of my neck just stood up. Fantastic. And it was like, what in the name of God is that? You yeah. know, that is absolutely fantastic, and that was the start of it all. Shall we play that track now, Pete, and uh, we'll have a feel of those hairs standing up, shall we? Yeah, I'd love to hear that again, it'd be great. We'll go for Hound Dog. We're going to play uh, by request of Pete Best, original Beatles drummer, Elvis Presley, and Hound Dog. The Jason Dale Radio Show, the way you like it. Uh, that was uh, the sound that uh, changed Pete's life when he heard the sound of, of Hound Dog by Elvis coming over the airwaves. Are you there, Pete? I am, yeah, I'm listening intently. <laughs> <laughs> when did you, uh, how did you get an opportunity to listen to that kind of music? Was it played on the radio? Uh, or did we listen on, the, on, where did you find out about it? Well, I mean, the only source of actually listening to it, you know, uh, before you actually went out and bought the record, uh, was on the radio. And yeah. then, of course, if you liked it, you, you know, ran off to the record shop and, you know, bought the old 78s, which you treasured, you know, in case you actually <laughs> dropped them on the floor and they smashed to pieces. Fantastic. And what radio station would that have been? Luxembourg or any of those kind of things? Yeah, mostly Luxembourg. You know, um, that was the, you know... Uh, Jack Jackson, you know, those type of programs on a Saturday night. He was playing the Top 20, which was, you know, uh, over in America. <laughs> and stuff which was starting to break through in the English charts. Yeah. Um, so that was the, you know, Saturday and Sunday night. You were glued to the, you know, the radio, listening to it. And then uh, if you wanted to learn a song, you were writing the words down and listening to the chords. And if you wanted to buy the record, you were making sure you got the title and who sang it and dashing off to the record shop on Monday. Yeah. 
Absolutely fantastic. So whilst all that was going on in America, and obviously the kids mm -hmm. in England were picking up on, on the sound of this new rock and roll sound, uh, there was things going on in the UK, in England, and obviously Liverpool. And uh, what was going on? What else? What felt a little more closer to home to you, Pete? Well, I think what you've got to remember, before we got blasted by the Americans, you know, with this great rock and roll, yeah. um, Skiflet started to infiltrate into Liverpool. You know, we'd, right. we'd had, you know, jazz bands and swing bands. You know, <coughs> Liverpool had always been a hotbed for any type of music which was coming. And Skiffle was on the airwaves. You know, we had the Kingston Trio in America and, you know, uh, Peter, Paul and Mary and all yeah. those types of people. But English-wise, you know, I suppose the guy who really stood out was Lonnie Donegan. Lonnie, um, yeah. You know, he come from a jazz background, um, but he went into Skiffle in a big way. Yes. And I suppose, you know, the the impression he made on rock and roll was because he was so versatile. Yeah. You know, he'd gone from, you know, early Skiffle, um, which was, you know, the Skiffle as we'd play it on an old sea chest bass, you know, and all that yeah. type of stuff. Yeah. So actually verging on the, the side of, you know, uh, comic songs, you yeah. know, and then basically actually, you know, making sure that his, you know, his later records had a rock background to them, which was incredible for a guy who started off in Skiffle and playing in a jazz band. Of course. It showed how versatile he was. Oh, it was fantastic. And the energy, when you listen to some of that music, it's uh, very, very basic three chord, you know, the it's almost like, you know, it's got the, the feel of punk music. And uh, I'd love Yeah, to but, uh, but I think when you listen to it, I mean, one of the great things about, you know, Lonnie for me was the fact that, okay, Simple chord structures initially, which Skiffle was, you know, yeah. basic three chord stuff. But you listen to his phrasing, and, it, you know, apart from listening to the music, if you just listen to the way he sings, yeah. he's singing it, and you want to dance to what he's singing. Yeah. You know, the, the music, the background behind it is just something which is there to enhance him. Incredible, his timing was absolutely perfect. Yeah, it's fantastic. And, of course, like you say, he came from a, a jazz background, and what, yeah. what do you think made Lonnie... Uh, change the, his complete style uh, around you know the mid 50s w what did that do you yeah think? I, th I think he had an awful lot to do with it to be quite honest um because initially he started off you know if you listen to him you know it was on acoustic guitars yeah typical skiffle background and of course when electric guitars started to come in yeah you know he gradually changed the sound and introduced you know i suppose you could turn around and say you know english electric guitars into his music yeah. which was the forerunner to, you know, the advent of rock and roll, you know, when everyone suddenly went, you know, put their acoustic guitars down and ran out to the shops and got an electric guitar and an amplifier and started yeah. twanging them that, that way. And anybody could do it. That was the thing, wasn't it? You didn't need the big produ production and uh, you could do it with a T-chest bass. And uh, what were you drumming? In? Were you drumming in those days, Pete, when Lonnie came out? Yeah, I just started to, you know, around about that advent, I was, you know, picked up a snare drum and a... Uh, you know, a pair of brushes, which he normally did in a skiffle band, you know. Um, and then, of course, he, he added a cymbal. And then with the advent of rock and roll, when he started, you know, changing over to electric guitars, you, yeah. you then turned around and said, OK, I need a drum kit. I need a drum kit. Now, where you go. Fantastic. Shall we play some Lonnie Donegan while we've still got time? Oh, it'd be great if you got one there, we've, yeah. We've got one. I've got, well, we've got one, one or two here now. We've got one of the fun songs, Chewing Gum, Lose Its Flavour. We've got Cumberland Gap. Which one would you prefer to hear now, Pete? Uh, I think in view of what we were talking about, listening to Don, the way Donny sings, yeah, um, you know, and the, the simplicity of it, Cumberland Cap, because Cumberland that was Cap. like the, you know, the forerunner to everything else which went on. Absolutely love it, and this one's uh, Lonnie Donegan's Cumberland Gap for Pete Best. <laughs> Let's get back to the music, and uh, what we're actually talking about is the music that influenced the Beatles. Uh, we've mentioned Elvis, uh, obviously mm -hmm. a massive influence, and uh, we moved over to Lonnie Donegan. Uh, a great performer, great songwriter. Now, there was another fella from America, Pete, uh, who would have come around just after Elvis and Lonnie, uh, from Lubbock in Texas. We're talking about Buddy Holly. Of course, yeah, one of the legends of rock and roll, yeah, one of the forerunners. What did Buddy Holly, what did Buddy Holly say to you when you first heard that sound, which was totally different to Elvis, obviously, but uh, obviously, you know, what was the first uh, impressions of the whole sound? I thought it was a t totally different wave of rock and roll. Um, his sound was so clean. Um, his guitar picking uh, was so clean. His, you know, his riffs were so clean. His vocal delivery. Um, and the fact that he was playing, you know, his own music. Um, and playing it in a, 
you know, a totally different style from Memphis, uh, you know, Elvis, which was like Memphis blues, you know, rocked up. You know, there was a Texas feel, you know, to uh, what was coming out of with uh, Buddy Holly and, it, and the crickets, and it was wonderful. It was totally different. He was, you know, bringing a new sound to the airwaves like a lot of the other rockers did, but, it's, you know, he was the forerunner of it, and, uh, you know, one of the, I suppose, the greats who died too too young, you know. Definitely, yeah. Shall we, uh, shall we play some Buddy Holly? We'll if you've got one there, we've, yeah. We've got, uh, I'll tell you what we'll, we'll put on here, which I've heard... Uh, on some of the recordings, I know you played on uh, a lot, of, most of the Hamburg, all of the Hamburg stuff, and of course the Decker sessions. Now I've got a, we've got crying, waiting, hoping. That was one uh, the Beatles that you did with the Beatles, wasn't it? That's right. Yeah, yeah, we did that at the. Uh, it was a favourite in Hamburg, and we did it at the the Decker sessions as well. The infamous Decker sessions. The infamous Decker sessions. Just let me yeah. make sure. I've got that here, Pete. I'm going to play that one. Uh, this is with uh, Pete Best. Um, live on Six Towns Radio, we're going to play some Buddy Holly, Crying, Waiting, Hoping. The Jason Dale Radio Show, the way you like it. Well, yeah, yeah great choice, good track. Thank you, and fantastic. So, uh, what's going on at the Casbah these days, Pete? What, you know, I know you get a lot of tourists there, but what kind of events do you actually promote? Well, the big one which is coming up uh, on August Bank Holiday Weekend, uh, Saturday, August the 23rd, is what we call Best Fest 6. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'll just get the plug in now that the tickets are available, you know, for Best Fest 6 on uh, my website, www.petebest.com. Um, so if people want to get them, they're flying out the door at the present moment. It's nearly a sellout, so it's first come, first serve. But uh, on that, that great night... Um, Funny, we're going to be playing, you know, you've been talking about the influence that uh, influences people that uh, in influence the Beatles. Yeah. Uh, it's a similar theme. You know, so we've got people who be on, you know, doing Buddy Holly, doing Elvis Presley, Billy Fury, yeah. Lonnie Donegan. Fantastic. Uh, I believe there's a young guy on there called Jason Dale. <laughs> who's going to make his, uh, um, I suppose you could turn around as a, a Liverpool first debut. showing at the Casbah. Definitely, We're all yeah. waiting with bated breath to see that. But yeah, it's going to be a great night. Um, you know, there'll be some surprise guests, which there always is yeah. that Casbah does. And, uh, my, you know, my band will, you know, rock the night out. Yeah. Uh, we'll be doing two sessions. And, uh, you know, lots of guest stars will be jumping up. It's just a fun night. You know, everyone comes, oh, yeah. you know, I'm come with... Sorry. Feel the atmosphere and enjoy yourself. That's what it's all about. I'm really looking forward to it myself. You know, I saw the Pete Best Band at the North Staffs Hotel here in Stoke last summer. And uh, it was a fantastic night. I, you mentioned when you had goosebumps when you heard Al the sound of Elvis in '56. Well, I had goosebumps that night watching your band, Pete. It was fantastic, and uh, it really was the, such an authentic sound, uh, the sound of Hamburg, and it was such a heavy and full sound as well. You know, even though it's retrospective when we're looking at 1959, 60, 61, it was still very, very mm -hmm. sound, and the sound of all that Chuck Berry stuff, and uh, it really was a fantastic night. Anybody who can make it along to the Casbah in August, uh, please do get the tickets early. It's going to be a fantastic night. You've got a Lonnie Donegan uh, band on as well, is that right, Pete? Yeah, um, the, the Black Diamonds, yes, yeah, so uh, I've heard them, they were great, you know, so, you know, what we yeah. were talking about, Lonnie Donegan, they've, you know, they've got them off to a, a T, if that's the expression for it, so uh, yeah. I'm looking forward to seeing them as well, you know, just to, uh, you know, chew the fat with them and uh, listen to them play and, you know, taking some good sounds from way back. Fantastic. Now, before I know you've got to go shortly, people, before we finish, uh, there's, uh, mm -hmm. there's one more fella, uh, another chap who was uh, from Liverpool and uh, yeah. he uh, hit the big time let's you know to put it that way uh, just a couple of years before the Beatles now Billy Fury uh, you've got a obviously you know a Billy Fury tribute on the night uh, the best of the Beatles what did Billy Fury as a Liverpool lad mean to yourself and the Beatles very important I mean you know I mean it, he was legendary in his own right, mm -hmm. um, but what you've got to remember, you know, for those that you know didn't know him when he first started, he was a Liverpool seaman, but he was the one of the first rock and rollers, what we would call true rock and rollers, right. to come out of Liverpool. Yeah. And of course, anyone who you know uh, wanted to follow suit, it was like, well, hang on a moment. There's a Liverpool lad who was a seaman, yeah. right, who's singing rock and roll. Yeah. If he can do it, we can do it. Right. So there was a lot of influence from him in a very quiet type of way. Yeah. Because, okay, he wasn't the out-and-out -out rock and roller that, you know, Presley and Buddy Holly and all the rest yeah. of it, but he had his own niche, 
you know, he had his own sound and his own charisma on stage. He was a great-looking guy. And uh, I think that was a great influence to a lot of young musicians as well. Yeah. There's a Liverpool lad. We're from Liverpool. Let's do it. Fantastic. So if he could do it, you could do it. And uh, that's what Billy Fury meant to you back in those days. Yeah, a great inspiration. Very much so, yeah. And of course, he was a Liverpool lad. That made it all the more important. Yeah, fantastic, Pete. Well, we're going to finish on uh, Billy Fury in Halfway to Paradise. I'd like to say a big thank you to you, Pete, for... Uh, you know, dropping by to say hello and uh, giving us an insight into the music that influenced the Beatles and, of course, you know, an insight into what it's like in the Casbah back then and, of course, today. So uh, thank you very much, Pete Best. Well, thank you for inviting me on the show and uh, I'm looking forward to meeting up with you again in August. Fantastic. Thanks again, See you in August. Thank you, Pete. Bye now. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.